Well, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at God's courts coming into his church, coming before him as his people. It's a sermon series on really going to church. And uh, two things, or two weeks ago, the sermon was entitled, What is Going to Church All About? And then last week, we looked at what happens when you truly meet with God in worship. And this week is sort of similar to that, but it looks more to the, to the fruit that comes out of that in your life, more of a focus on that. What is, why is it good to go to church? That's what we're looking at today. Why is it so good to be in the house of the Lord, so much better than a thousand days elsewhere? So last week the focus was on what happens when you worship, particularly this week it will be more specifically about the long-term the benefits that come into our life, the little short-term and long-term benefits that come into our life. So I want to look at two passages today, and the first would be the one that we read just a minute ago, Ephesians chapter 2 and 3. And then Psalm 92 will be the second one that we'll look at, and I'll read that one now. So please give your attention because this is the Word of God. Psalm 92, beginning in verse 1 beginning with the title, actually, in uh, our English Bibles. A psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And may God bless to our hearing these words from God's word. In previous sermons in this series, I have told you that the reason the church is called the church is because it comes from a word that means an assembly or a congregation. And because we are the people in this fallen, sinful world who are gathered into a worshiping assembly before the face of the true and living God. The word church that means congregation or assembly We're given that name because it is our unique privilege to be the congregation of the living God. The church of God. Those words roll off of us. The church of God roll off of our tongue so easily without thinking about the significance of what it is to be people that come before the face of God. This is spoken about all through the New Testament, especially of what this means for us. It's the very thing that makes us stand out uniquely in the world. By Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, we are brought to the Father. This is amazing because we're sinners just like everyone else. We are completely cut off from the Father by our own merit, just like everyone else. Toward all His creatures, you know, God is a gracious, loving, caring, kind Master in God. 
but toward those who have corrupted themselves as the human race has, then God is a consuming fire of vengeance and fiery indignation. To come before him as a sinner is to be brought under his wrath and his fiery indignation, except for the mercy of God. Through Christ, the Son of God, who became fully human while still continuing to be God, we are given access to God as our Father, who is reconciled to us, not as, no, not as a consuming fire to us, but as one who welcomes us into his courts. We who are cut off from him with the rest of the human race are now able to, to draw near to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And my dear friends, the scripture teaches us that we especially come before God, especially when we gather together in public worship with Christ our head. That's what we do when we go to church on Sunday morning. It becomes so routine and so mundane to us. This is something that we as Christians should not want to miss. In the Old Testament, the Jews drew near in a symbolic way. There were glory clouds and there were flaming fires and things that consumed sacrifices. God would come down with fire to consume the sacrifice. There were temples. And there were priests with their robes and sacrifices that were offered on the altar, the shedding of blood, washings and things. And even in all that symbolism, the Jews, even in the symbolism, could not come into the holiest place. Only the priest once a year, and that only with an offering of blood, sacrifice. First he had to offer for his own sins and be cleansed himself, and then coming reverently before God. And we are able to come regularly into the most holy place before the face of the living God, not just with symbols, not in temples that men have made with their hands that God appointed in the Old Testament, but we're able to come before the living God with Christ our head. Now Christ has come as our priest and he has offered himself for our sins and for that, for the sins of the Jewish people as well. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. And we're able to come right in to the holy place of God and meet with him and have him deal with our souls bringing comfort to us in his promises, bringing his word of command to us for our obedience that we might live for him. This morning, I want to begin by showing you how this privilege of coming before the Father through Christ is presented to us in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 that we read just a moment ago. It's presented as something, this coming before God is presented as something that transforms us. It makes us New, it, it changes us from what we are and makes us into a holy dwelling place for God. So please turn to Ephesians 2 and 3 and walk through an overview of this passage with me. First of all, as we look at this chapter, bask in the privilege, these chapters, to be the church of God. The assembly that is being transformed to be a holy dwelling place for God. Look how it starts. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 tells us how we who are dead in sins have been made alive. We have been given true faith, something we do not have on our own. We've been given faith that unites us to Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And by Him, united to Him in faith, we have complete forgiveness of sins. And so as God's church, then we are now his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, for good works. We who are sinners are now put into a completely new situation where we can please God, where we can serve God, where he's actually working in us to change us so that we can serve him even more. It's all by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ that this is possible. We are a people restored from ruin to be the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, the assembly of God. And in Ephesians 2, 11 through 18, 
we are reminded that we were completely cut off until this was done for us. Completely. As we who are the Gentiles, I don't think there are any people of Jewish descent here, we were completely cut off from God until Jesus came. In verses 11 and 12, Paul explains that while Israel was set apart from the other nations, they had the covenants and the promises and circumcision, all these things, the Gentiles did not have that. They were cut off. We were completely cut off and without hope, without God in the world, dead in our sins, unable to come before God is anything other than as a consuming fire to us because of our sins. But in verse 13, it, as it says, Now in Christ Jesus, in Him, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now you know, of course, that the blood of Christ speaks of the atonement that He made for our sins on the cross. And the wonderful news is that on the basis of that sacrifice, we can come to God completely forgiven. In fact, Paul explains, if you look in verse 14 through 16, that both we who are far off from God, as well as the Jews who are near, are reconciled together in one body to the Father. Instead of there being a separation between us who are cut off and from the Jews as there was under the old covenant, the Jews who are near to God, us who are far from God, the barrier has been broken down of all those regulations and ordinances that were required of them in order to be able to come before that, that ceremonial uh, worship. Now that's been broken down. And Christ has reconciled both us and the Jews in one body by the cross before the Father so that we together come before him. And now as it says in verse 17 and 18, He, Jesus, is preaching peace to us Gentiles who are far away from God and to the Jews who are near to Him but not so near as they are now that He has come. The result is that both they and we now have full access to the Father. And you remember Jesus is preaching regularly to us because He's the one that appointed the word of God that he has given us to be preached in the churches. It's his preaching. By Christ, they no longer have a mere symbolic access with temples and priests representing things, and the, the Jews no longer have that. But now both they and we Gentiles have, as verse 18 says, access by the Spirit to the Father. That's the great privilege we've been talking about from whence the church gets its name that we have access to the Father. We are the church that gathers to Him. Jesus Himself has reconciled us to the Father and we are His assembly now. In Ephesians 2, 19-22, Paul tells us what God is doing with this assembly. Look at it and see, verse 19-22. through 22. You see there in verse 21, it says that we are put together that with, with one another that we might grow into a holy temple in the Lord. We're put together with Christ. The word translated temple that's used here is not just the word that refers to the temple as a whole, the, the building as a whole, but it's the naos, the, the, the holy place is the word that's used there. It's a, it's a narrower word for temple into the, the very holy place. It's God's assembly built upon Jesus Christ. We're growing into a dwelling place for God Almighty Himself. Look at verse 21 and 22 together. It says, In whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The church is the assembly where God dwells in the midst of her. Just think of it. You are members of the household of God in Christ. You are built, as verse 20 says, upon Christ himself as the cornerstone, the word of the apostles and prophets. And as an assembly in him before the Father, we are growing in the Spirit. The Spirit is working to make us more and more of a dwelling place that's fit for him. It's a powerful work. Paul is absolutely thrilled to be chosen to declare this mystery 
to the Gentiles. Look at his attitude. He speaks about it in chapter 3. Christ especially appointed him, he tells us, to declare the mystery. A mystery is something that we can't know unless we're told about it. You can know about God's eternal power and divine nature by looking at creation. But you can't know that he redeemed Gentiles. You can't know that he sent Christ to redeem Jews and Gentiles unless he tells you that that's what he did. And Paul says the mystery that the Gentiles are included in the church is what God has told him. He describes the mystery in 3.6. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, inheritors of the same body with the Jews and partakers of the promise of Christ. All those promises that were given in the Old Testament of blessing. That the promise of Christ through the gospel, through the good news of what Christ has done, he says, which I have be, of which I have become a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Paul understands how significant this is. Look at some of the words that he uses. In verse 7, he says that he's preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. I mean, you see people freaking out because they won the lottery or something. You know, one day in the courts of God is better than that. To hear what we have in Christ Jesus. To be told of the everlasting communion that we have with the Father through Him. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ. Riches that you can't even get to the bottom of as you meditate on them. And in verse 10, he speaks of how celestial beings in heaven are an audience. That they're able to look down at the church and learn about the manifold wisdom of God. They're able to see the grace of God and the power of God and the love of God. They are filled with with wonder as they look upon us and see God's dealings with us in Christ. And in verse 11, he speaks of how in Christ we have access with confidence through faith in Him. There again, the amazing thing, we can come with confidence before the Father. We're able to go with confidence in a place where we could not possibly go with confidence if it were not for what he has done by grace. Paul is so delighted with what God is doing that he prays earnestly that God would carry out this great work in the church in verses 14 to 21. He prays that this assembly that God has called together would experience the power of God's working in them. Look at verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in the church to transform us into new creations in Christ Jesus. We need to get our eyes upon that again, brothers and sisters, so that we come eagerly with prayer and searching and yearning for God to work in us, looking for Him to work as we gather together in His name. Paul is full of prayers about this. Look, this, look at what, he else, what else he says. Verse 18 and 19. That we would be able to get it. Okay, that's what he's, That we would be able to understand what has been given to us. That we would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You can search it out forever and ever, and you can never exhaust it. It passes all knowledge that we might be filled with the fullness of God. We learn about God the Father by comprehending the love of God that's revealed in Christ crucified. And as we more and more comprehend that love, we are transformed so that we are more and more filled with the fullness of God in our lives. We need to be yearning for that, brothers and sisters, yearning for our others to have that in the church of Jesus Christ. Paul is praying for the church, that the church would be changed as we come before God in the assembly. The Spirit works and the gospel works, and we are changed into a holy dwelling place for God by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now that surely shows you why you ought to come to church. 
It's not just, oh, rule, I have to go to church. You know, I have these rules put on. No, no, look, this should be something that you're clamoring to do. It's an assembly that ha has that kind of effect on you or can have that kind of effect on you. It is in the assembly that you deepen your knowledge of Christ and the gospel. You need to pray that that would happen to you. And if, and if it is an assembly that you are changed by the power that raised Jesus from the dead into something new, and if it is here that you have true access to the Father and connect with Him as His congregation, then the church is something that you don't want to miss. Let's turn now to Psalm 92 and consider further why it is good to come. Psalm 92, which we read earlier. The first thing we see in this psalm is that it is good and right for us to come before God to confess His name. The title of the psalm reminds us that this is something that we are to do each Sabbath day. You see the title there. In the Hebrew, this is actually the first verse of the psalm. It reads, a psalm a song from the Sabbath day. Sometimes we ignore these titles, but many consider, and I think they're right, that they are part of the inspired word of God that is given to us in Scripture. Whether that's accepted or not, though, the title testifies that the ancient understanding of the Jews was that this song was particularly referring to worship on the Sabbath day, the day that God set apart each week for us to lay aside our regular activities and to gather in the assembly to worship Him. We saw how in previous sermons, how in Leviticus 23.3, that God calls for a holy convocation in all of their villages and dwelling places on the Sabbath day in their local communities. A convocation, a calling together of people. And in, of course now in the New Covenant, the weekly Sabbath day has been changed by Christ to the first day of the week, which we call Sunday or the Lord's Day. This song speaks to the good thing that it is for the assembly or the church to praise God each week. So here in verse 1 and 2, we're simply told that it is good to thank and praise the Lord. Of course it's a good thing for God's people to do this. It's fitting and right that we should praise Him because He's worthy of praise and because we are no longer cut off from Him, but we're able to come before Him and praise Him and have Him be pleased with it because of what He has done <coughs> for us in Christ. It's entirely inappropriate that the God of the universe who has redeemed His people should not be praised and thanked. This, in fact, is the most important thing that you have been given to do. As a creature, it's an obligation that we all have to worship God. We were made to be his worshipers. And so this simply says, it's good to do this. It's a good thing. And then in verse 2, it shows us that we should in particular declare his loving kindness. Actually, it says, declare, and that word means to make conspicuous, to bring it before people so they can see it. Declare his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness at night. Now that doesn't mean that we do a thing called declaring his loving kindness in the morning, and then at night we do something different that's called declaring his faithfulness. No, it's, it's a Hebrew way of saying, this is what you do all day. From, from morning till evening, you're declaring God's loving kindness and his faithfulness as his people. This is, this is what you've been given to do. The word loving kindness refers to his covenant love. His saving grace, that word hesed that we run into so much. His saving grace that for us in the New Testament is now revealed more fully through the gospel of Jesus Christ than ever before. We have seen this, haven't we? In all this series about worship, we have seen this. That it is the gospel that Jesus declares to us in the New Testament assembly that is the real occasion for our prayers. It's the, it's the core of what we learn, how we learn of God. It's the thing that he declares to us now because he has commanded his ministers to preach the gospel in the assembly of his people, to declare what God the Father has done, what Paul called preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ, 
that we have access to the Father through Jesus who was crucified for us, that he has reconciled us to the Father. We are to talk about the wet, the width and the length and the depth and the height of his love, of his loving kindness, you see, to us in Christ and of his faithfulness in carrying out his saving work. That's the heart and core of New Testament worship. Jesus, our risen priest, declared to us that the Father has accepted his sacrifice for our sins. And he leads us in singing praise when we gather before the face of God each Lord's Day. And we are to do this, as it says, with a harmonious sound. In the Old Covenant, they used all sorts of instruments to embellish their praises. But in the New Covenant, we're told to make melody in our hearts, in the The harmony we are to have is between our voices and the plucking of the strings of our hearts to accompany that singing. Ephesians 5 says literally that we're to pluck the strings of our heart. The theatrics are gone because the reality has come. When you have reality, like if you're in a crisis situation and a house is burning down, you don't have to have music playing in the background to make it seem more real. There's no need for music. Because the thing is real. And so it is. If we really get what it is, I know it's a stretch for us sometimes, trying to sing without all the embellishments, you know, to have the big symphony and the worship band and all, all these different things. But we, we need to come with simple singing, looking at what we're talking about in the singing, who we're talking about, what he's done. And because that's so much greater in the New Testament now, we don't have all the things that go along with when it was a show of display, a visual display of things with the Levites playing their songs. How glad God has made us through his work. Verse 4 says, For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. How glad we are to be forgiven of our sins and to know that we have victory In Christ Jesus. We know as we saw in Ephesians 3. That the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Is at work in us. It's a victorious power. It's a conquering all subduing power. What is it doing? It is making us a fitting place for God to dwell. That's what's happening to us in the assembly. And we're glad for that work. It makes us glad. It's good for us then to come and give thanks and praise for this each Lord's Day. We need to take up fresh praises each week. And how do you do that? By having a renewed heart, a prepared heart. We're going to talk about preparing this afternoon when we look at receiving the word. But it's so good for us to do this. Coming before him is also good because when you do, you refresh your faith each week. Okay, Week by week. As you go through the week, It's easy to lose your perspective, isn't it? About what's important, about what really matters, about the value of the kingdom of God. He is a God to be greatly feared because as it says in verse 5, his works are very great. Paul kept talking about the unsearchableness of these things, the unsearchableness of God. His thoughts are very deep. He's the creator of the universe. He's the redeemer of his people. His thoughts are incomprehensible to us. We can't fully contain them or or grasp them. You can't possibly trace out all of God's ways. Psalm 139 speaks about how God even knows our sitting down and our rising up. Knows the very thoughts that are in our heart of everyone, all at the same time, all over the world. It speaks of how he has hedged us behind and before. All all the things that come into our life are, are all under his control. (coughs) excuse me, and it says in verse 6 in Psalm 139, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. As we've been seeing in this worship series, God is not one that you come before and start counseling. Say, oh God, I think you should have done it this way. Why did you do it like that? Or that you correct. You know, he's running the universe. He's the judge of all. You remember Job? Put my hand over my mouth. I've got nothing to say because 
I've seen the glory of God now. I, I can't, I, I, he, he knows what he's doing. That's, that's all I can say. He's revealed his salvation to us, and it is for us to receive that revelation with gladness, not to try to modify it, make it more palatable for people, make it more comfortable for us, make it something else that we want it to be. No, you receive it because it is his salvation that he has given us. It's in, you can't alter it. What it is, it is. Coming before him in worship helps you to realize how great God is, how great his works are, so that you can bow down to him in worship. See how deep his thoughts are and what he has done. Now you need to gain this fresh perspective of God every week because you lose sight of it. The world has a very different perspective. As it says in verse 6, a senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. God is not in his thoughts, you see. He's a fool. He ignores God. He says, no God. There is no God. The fear of the Lord, we're told in Scripture, is the beginning of wisdom. But he completely ignores God. Isn't that what most of the people around you at work do? They, God is irrelevant. He's got nothing to do with anything. And that's what you live with all through the week. And when you're surrounded by those who think this way, it can start to rub off on you. You can lose your eternal perspective. You can start to think that God isn't really very important. You can turn your focus onto my new clothes that I got or your status in the world. Boy, I'm, I'm climbing up the, the corporate ladder here. Or your possessions. Look at the new stuff that I got. And that's all you can see. Not, those are things that you thank God for. They're not the things where your praise ends. Things that you actually, you start to live for those things. You start to live for empty things. Solomon did that, didn't he? He married all his foreign wives, and they turned his heart away. He started living for the wrong stuff. He said, I filled my life with everything, and I found out it was all vanity. That's what people find out. That's why the people who have the most of the world are the least happy. They're the ones that want to commit suicide because they already had everything, and they see that it's all vanity. See, you start to live for the empty things, thinking that that's all there is. Because that's how it is with the people you're around. You can stop laying, you stop laying down your life for others. You think, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm, I'm the important one here. I'm not here to serve others. I'm here to be served. You start becoming self-centered and you start to criticize others. You know, they annoy you. Just seeing it. Uh, uh, they annoy you. You get bothered. You become bitter and resentful. You stop living for Christ and his kingdom. You lose your perspective. Like the people around you who do not know God, you start to think that immediate success is the only thing that matters. Verse 7 in Psalm 92. It explains that when the wicked man prospers, when he, as it says, springs up like grass. We're seeing that happen outside now, aren't we? The grass is turning green. We see it springing up. And uh, you know, he and his friends are, are flourishing. And they think, wow, you know, we're, we got it made. Look at us. He says he doesn't know that he will be destroyed. They think that everything is going great for them. They boast of their success. They boast about their sin. They boast about their immorality, about their sexual immorality, about their drinking, about their slick maneuvers in business where they pulled something over and gained an advantage about their successful ventures that they've made, the revenge that they got on their ex-spouse, all the money that they made, whatever. <coughs> they do not realize that God has turned them over to this success to prepare them for destruction. Like Pharaoh, for this cause I raised you up that I might make my power known to you. You became this proud, arrogant wretch that thought you don't need God at all. So now I'm going to knock you down off your pedestal so that everyone will know that I am Lord. That's what the Lord did with Pharaoh. They don't realize that. Their fortunes are making them more and more proud and more and more hardened against God. But God is going to humble them on the day of judgment and expose their folly. 
they will not be given a second chance. When you come before the Lord in weekly worship, he renews your heart and your mind so that everything is brought back into a right perspective again. In Psalm 73, we sing about having, how we lost our perspective and then when, when the wicked was pro, were prospering around us and uh, they seemed to have no sorrows or troubles. You remember Psalm 73? You start to wonder to the point of you know, whether it's really worth it to serve the Lord because you know, you're looking at things in a temporal way, same way the world is. And you say, they seem to be getting on better than I am. But then what happens in Psalm 73? What changes everything? Do you remember? You come into the sanctuary. You come into the sanctuary, and then you see that they're set in slippery places. Just what it says here in Psalm 92. They're on a pathway to destruction. And we, we are safe in Christ. And we see that afresh when we come to the sanctuary, when we come into the holy place. This clear understanding about the wicked in contrast with you who have come to Christ for salvation is set forth in Psalm 92 further in verses 8 through 11. First in verse 8 and 9, we see that though the wicked prosper, God still reigns, making it certain that they will be brought down. It says, but you, O Lord, in contrast with those who are flourishing in wickedness, but you, O Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. You see the vanity of life without God. You see it, what they miss. And at the same time, as verse 10 says, you see the privilege that belongs to you in the church, in the congregation of the Lord. You're among those who are reconciled to him by Christ, who have access to him through Christ and who have the spirit forming you into a dwelling place for the Father. And in verse 10 you say, but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Now the horn was a symbol of strength. And the idea here is that God's church, the idea here is that as God's church in Christ, we through Christ have been raised in strength. Okay, he is our horn. He is the prominent strength among us, the mighty one that came among us to deliver us and he was received by the Father and exalted to the Father's right hand. And the same power that raised him from the dead when he had conquered our sins is at work to raise us up through him. He is our horn, and he has been raised up to glory, and we're going to follow him to glory. Okay, that's our destiny. And in the second part of verse 10, we speak of how we have been anointed with fresh oil. The oil, anointing with oil, represents the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Christ was given the Spirit without measure. That's why he's called Christ. Remember what the name means, Christ? The anointed one. Same thing that Messiah means. The one who is anointed with something. And he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And he gives the Spirit to us. So that we are said to have an anointing from the Father. He, was, he has baptized us with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit abides with us and works in us and will remain in us forever. But we also receive a fresh anointing when we come before God in His holy dwelling place in the assembly of His people. The Spirit's work is refreshed in us when we come before God in a way that benefits us. We look for God to give us fresh supplies of the Spirit of grace so that we might welcome the truth, so that we might delight in the gospel, so that we might see the glory of God, so that we might be convicted of our sins, so that we might be enabled to put off our sin and to have strength to live a new life for God with freshness. If you do not come before God each week, you lose the benefit of this refreshment that our Lord has provided for us as his people. And in coming before God, you not only see your privilege, but you also see how your enemies have been defeated already. Not only that they will be, but they have been. Verse 11 says, My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. Satan and the foolish men of this world who do not fear God, 
what do they do? They rise up against you to tear down your faith. What we were talking about over the week, how they rub on you. They try to convince you that you're foolish for serving God, that there's nothing in that. They mock and they scoff and they exclude you. Sometimes they even slander you and they sometimes attack your property or your person. They do this because they know that you represent Christ. And that makes them uneasy. It bothers them because they know it's true. And they're trying to suppress that truth. And you're there representing that truth. And they don't like that. They don't want to admit that. That's why they don't turn against other religions. You know, I remember when my daughter was at a home school thing, and there were people from all different religions. She was the only one, I think, that was really a Bible-believing type Christian among the ones that were there. And they all had these different views. And all of them converged upon her. Because that's the truth that scared them. That's what all of them were trying to avoid. Very, very interesting. Verse 11 says that you have already seen them stopped. For Israel, what did they seen? Pharaoh and his armies. They were helpless before them. They were drowned in the Red Sea. And then they went to Canaan. They mowed down their enemies in Canaan as they followed the Lord. But much more for us, what have we seen? We have seen Satan defeated by Christ. He says, I have overcome. He has overcome temptation. He has endured the cross. And now Jesus is invading Satan's kingdom. As we saw last week, he's going forth with his gospel into the world. And the gates of Hades can't stand up against it. He's breaking in over here. He's breaking in over there. The gospel is going all around the world. And the Gentiles that he said would be brought in are being brought in. <coughs> we see our enemies defeated. And we know that they will not be able to stand against Christ and his church. They will not be able to draw us away from Christ because he is our redeemer. And if we are in him, he will keep us until the end. So week by week, you need to come and renew your faith. You need to come and be strengthened with the spirit of God in the assembly of God. You need to look for this. So that's the second reason that you ought to come to church each Lord's Day. And now I want to come to the third reason. Come before the Lord each Lord's Day because of the cumulative effect it will have on you over the years. And we saw in Ephesians that the Lord is at work in us to make us a dwelling place for Him. Remember all those things that we saw that were related to this? Ephesians 2.10 We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He created us for that purpose. Ephesians 2.22, that we're being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. As verse 21 puts it, we're being fitted together that we might grow into a holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 3.16-19, through 19, that He is strengthening us with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that we might know the love of Christ and be filled with the fullness of God. Well, Psalm 92.12-15 through 15, speaks of those who are part of the assembly that dwells before the face of God as bearing fruit throughout their whole lives. That's what you do as church, as part of the church. In verse 12, it says the righteous will flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar tree. Palm trees are known for their great strength. They're very strong trees, and they're green all year long. A single tree a date palm can produce 200 pounds of dates in one year. They're remarkable trees. And cedar trees are known for their great size and for their durability, their longevity. It's not unusual for a cedar tree to last for over a thousand years. Verse 14 explains that as his people in his courts, we will still be bearing fruit in old age. They will be fresh and flourishing. And of course, not in the way the world measures prosperity, but in the way the Lord does. In godliness. In their love for the gospel that is deepened that we've been talking about. In knowing Christ as he is revealed in the gospel. In loving the Father and loving the Son. In being filled with the Spirit. In loving others. 
in the world, the, the older are fit to be thrown out. That's what the world is planning to do with older people. They're planning to start euthanasia where they cut off the life earlier and over, earlier. They're no longer productive, they say. They've got nothing. They're burned out because they can no longer enjoy the things that this world says are the only things that matter. But when those fruits that I was talking about, the, the things that really matter, the things that really last, the things that are so important, when, when you see the beauty of those fruits increasing in those who get older, increasing to the end, even when old age ravages their bodies, they deepen their love for Christ and his kingdom and for his gospel. Make no mistake about who enjoys this. It's not everyone. It's only the righteous. As we saw in Ephesians, no one is righteous except who? Those that are joined to Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that are a holy temple to the Lord. If you're not on that foundation, you can be here structurally, but you're not really in Christ. It's with Him and only with Him as our Savior that we are true members of the church who truly do come before the Father's face and bear fruit. It is only as built upon Christ as our foundation that we're planted in the courts of the house of our God. Make no mistake about who it is then. Yes, you can come to church without Christ in a bodily way. You can show up here physically. You could sit here like I've talked about, like a stone, not get a thing. You could show up to the assembly, but there will be no lasting fruits in old age. You can be here every week. You'll not be full of fruit and flourishing like the palm and the cedar tree when you're old unless you repent. Verse thir- as verse 13 puts it, it's only those who are planted in the house of the Lord that flourish in his courts. And you're not a true part planted in that house to receive life from the root unless you're planted in Christ. But if you are in him, What good will it do you to be in the assembly of his people Lord's Day after Lord's Day over the years? The cumulative effect is phenomenal. Your mind will be washed week after week after week with his word. You will be renewed in the way that we talked about where you'll see the things that are important week after week after week. You'll be empowered with his grace to live for him week after week after week. You will grow in your love for Christ and his gospel and be filled with all the fullness of God, the very things that Paul prays for at the end of Ephesians 3. You will be flourishing and fruitful in old age. In those years, all those years, you will be declaring, as it says in verse 15, that the Lord is upright, that he is a rock, and that there is no unrighteousness in him. See, it's about God and what he does. When we, cut, when we gather together in his name. All through the years, you will look back and see that he has preserved you. All through the years, you'll see how he has fed you and your household with spiritual food. All through the years, you will see how he's delivered you from your enemies. All through the years, you will see that he has kept his promises. And you'll say, he's upright. He does what he says he will do. There is fruit in your life. There is fruit in your household. There is fruit in the lives of those that you have influenced for Jesus Christ. All those years in his courts will not be wasted. All of those Sundays that you have come before his face and worshipped him and drunk of the new wine of the word and the spirit and have filled with fruit, been filled with fruit and new life. And now in old age, you're happier than ever because now you're closer than ever to meeting him face to face in glory. You are gathered, you have gathered by faith in spirit and in truth, and now you're rather ready to go to glory and be in his immediate presence. Now you will be with Christ who is risen in his glorious body, and you will be there waiting for the resurrection of your body until the last day when he comes. How glad you will be for all of those years that you have been a worshiper in God's house through Jesus Christ. Not a dead block in the church, but an eager worshiper receiving life that God gives to his people. Young people, let me urge you, do not waste your Sabbath days. Do not waste them. One day in the courts of the Lord is better than a thousand elsewhere. 
It's a valuable thing. It's a precious thing. All the vain things that you pursue in this world cannot compare with one day in the courts of the house of the Lord, growing in grace, learning of His ways, walking in the light of His truth. And all the glory goes to your rock, your righteous Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Please stand and let's thank Him. Lord, as we come before you, we have to confess, Lord, that much of what is presented to us here in your word is that which we have not much experienced. Father, we have tasted of these things, and we're very, very thankful for that. But Father, how we yearn that we would be filled with the fullness of God. Lord, the church in our land is in such a low ebb. Father, how else is it that we have hearts that gravitate towards stuff like pornography or covetousness or you know, how we look with our new clothes or, or you know, just, Lord, it's just, we, we realize, Lord, that we're just barely scratching the surface of grasping the things that you have prepared for those that love you. And I pray, Lord, that you would put us on our knees before you, that we would start crying out to you for, for the fullness of your blessing in our assemblies. Father, we have been half-hearted. And how can we expect to receive anything from you when we're half-hearted? Lord, we pray that you would work by your Spirit in us. We pray, Lord, that you would give us great delight in the treasures that you have for us. That we could honestly say, not just that we know it's true, but we could honestly see that one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere thousand anywhere else is one day. Father, we pray that we would have a proper perspective of things. We pray that you would give us that, that clarity when we do come before you, that we would be refreshed and renewed, that you would anoint us with fresh oil, a fresh giving of the Holy Spirit, so that we will go from here, so those who are ready to represent you in the world, to know you in the world, to walk with you. When we want to be like Enoch, who walked with you. Father, we want to be those who are enriched by all the good things that you have for us. We want the word to be to us like a treasure. Father, that we mine out, that we, we come as those that are digging for a treasure. That Think about the people at the gold rush or things and just how, how eager they were. Father, we need that. We pray that you would work in us, Lord. Help us not to believe the lies of Satan. Help us not to believe the lies of the world, the lies of our own hearts that tell us that there's nothing there. Father, we know that your word tells us that there's everything there. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ that we deal with when we come to church. That it's a dwelling place of God in the spirit being prepared. It's power that raised Jesus from the dead that's at work in us. Father, please, we pray, rise up, raise up your people in this church, in this congregation, that we may walk with you and we may know you and we may be changed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.